Leviticus chapter 26. I'm going to read the very first verse of Leviticus 26. In this verse, God provides instruction that he repeats multiple times throughout the Old Testament as he emphasizes and re-emphasizes a, a principle and instruction that is contained in this verse. God speaks to his people and says, Ye shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it. For I am the Lord your God. There's a phrase that I've said many times, and I've heard so many others say that God has to be number one in our lives. Anybody ever said that? Anybody ever heard that? God's got to be number one. But I started thinking about that phrase. I thought, you know, I, I don't think that God really is interested in being number one in your life. Because to be number one seems to indicate that there might be a number two and a number three and a number four. And he, he's not interested in just being the number one God on your list of many gods. He wants to be only. He wants to be your only God. There, there is no other God. There is no other Savior. There is no other Lord. There's only one God. He wants to be your only God. Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar has constructed this idol made of gold and he's called the officials of the kingdom together dedicating that idol. He gave the command, when the music starts playing, you are to bow down and worship the idol. Those who don't bow down, you'll be cast into a fiery furnace. It's pointed out to the king, there's three Hebrew boys who refuse to bow down and the king is furious. He calls them in, demands an answer and he issues the command again explaining the consequences for defying that command. And he issues this specific challenge. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? In Daniel chapter 3, verse number 16, they respond. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, we don't have to say anything. We're pretty sure that our actions speak for themselves. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They defy the command of the king. What a dynamic and defining moment for th these three young Hebrew boys and really a defining moment for the entire nation of Israel. I want to preach to you from this subject tonight, an idol called image. An idol called image. I am preaching tonight against the spirit of this age. There is a spirit in the culture around us. It is a pervasive spirit. It's an aggressive spirit spirit. It is a militant spirit. It's an in-your-face spirit. And my question tonight, my challenge, not just my challenge, the challenge of the Holy Ghost tonight, is there a young person here tonight? Is there a young apostolic in the Atlantic district who will be the one who will stand up when everybody else bows down? Who will be the one who will stand up when everybody else compromises? When everybody else gives in? When everybody else just goes with the flow? I'm wondering, is there somebody tonight who will join me in this fight against the spirit of this age and will with the word and the spirit stand up and say we're going to be victorious we're going to stand for truth we're going to stand for righteousness I want you to lift your voice right now with me I want you to join me come on do you sense the fight that we're in tonight do you sense what's happening in the spirit I want you to lift your voice right now in great praise come on I want you to praise with boldness I want you to make a commitment to God right now God I'm standing for you I'm standing for truth and for righteousness
on just another moment I, I sense something just kind of breaking in the spirit right now come on do you feel that resistance that cultural pressure that's pressing in against us your flesh right now is saying why don't we just pray for 30 seconds and move on and, and hear a good message and go on and have fun later but there's something in the spirit that's saying why don't you resist a little bit against that resistance that you feel in the spirit oh I feel a holy boldness a holy boldness rising up in somebody that's saying I'm going to be the one I'm not bowing down I'm not giving in I'm not sitting down I'm not going to be quiet I don't care what culture says I don't care what, what the accepted thing is no there's something in me that's calling me to something greater to a place that's higher God bless you. You can be seated. God understood very well the temptation that his people would face. The pressure that they would encounter as they conquered nations and entered their promised land. He knew that they would encounter intriguing philosophies. That they would be exposed to new ideas and that they would be introduced to the gods of those that they would conquer. So God gave them clear instruction when they possess new territory in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Beginning in verse number 2, he said, You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, on the high mountains and the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn down their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. He knew... That if they did not remove the high places and completely destroy the idols of those nations, that they would soon lose their way and begin to turn away from him to serve other gods. So time and time again, he spoke through Moses, through Joshua, through the prophets. He warned them of the dangers of idolatry, detailed the consequences of such actions. He said, evil will befall you. You'll be utterly destroyed. You'll be led away into captivity if you begin to serve their God. Even the New Testament church dealt with the issue of idolatry. The, ep the epistles declare that idolaters are among those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And idolatry is listed as a work of the flesh. Idolaters will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone the second death. Now, I'm not concerned tonight that very many of you will go back to your hotel room or your, your home if it's local and that you're going to go into your, your room and that you're going to get some, some wood or maybe some precious stones or rocks and that you're going to build a shrine in the corner of your room and begin to bow down and to worship that idol. I'm not too concerned that that's going to happen. Now, if I am speaking to somebody that's having problems with that temptation, let me just tell you, it's wrong. You don't need to do that. Don't be da bowing down before any idols in your bedroom. But I am concerned tonight that there are some idols of the heart that we got to deal with. That there's some priority realignment that we need to consider tonight. That there are some passions of the heart that we need to consider. There are some idols of the heart that we need to think about. And just as God gave the instruction to his people in the Old Testament, there's only one way that you can deal with an idol. You can't pacify it. You can't put it away in the closet and think I'll just kind of keep it there out of sight, out of mind. There's only one way to deal with an idol. You got to bring it to the altar. You got to kill it. You got to destroy it. You got to burn it. You got to get rid of it. You have to destroy the idols of the heart. It's the only way you can deal with an idol. It's the only way. The apostle Paul said, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? So what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? 
What business does an apostolic young person have being involved with idolatry? Paul said to flee idolatry. Keep yourselves from idols. Let me share with you one of perhaps the most frightening verses in the Bible to me. It's Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 4. The Bible says, Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and put at the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. He said, you better, you better think about what happens when you come before the prophet or you come into the presence of God and you know that the stumbling block of your iniquity is there. You know you're not quite where you need to be with God. You know you haven't made every decision that you needed to make this week. You know there's some faults and some failures, but you just kind of overlook those things. And you come into the presence of God and just act like nothing is wrong, act like nothing's happened, you've messed up, but you just come on, put the facade, just kind of worship God, you know the right words, you know the right actions, you know the right response for everybody to think that it's okay that you're doing good and living for God like you need to he said you better be careful coming into the presence of God ignoring the stumbling block of your iniquities he said because God will answer you according to the idols of your heart in other words God may answer your prayer even if it's not your his will think about that God might answer your prayer even if it's not his will that scares me to death that I could come to God and I could pray and he could answer my prayer and I think everything's all right because God answered my prayer when all the while he's answering according to the idols that I've allowed to develop in my heart I don't think it was the will of the father to give the prodigal son his inheritance but he answered his prayer anyway And we know what happened there. We know the end of that story where he finds himself in a pig pen with nothing, with nobody. And finally, thank God, he comes to himself. But let me just help somebody tonight. You don't have to go that route. You don't have to end up in a pig pen somewhere. You don't have to go that direction. That's why you need to check yourself. That's why we need a spirit of discernment. That's why we need the word of God to help us to understand exactly where we are. That I'll answer according to the idol of the heart. What is an idol of the heart? The Hebrew word for idol in the ancient Hebrew language, the word picture that is depicted there is a foot with two shepherd staffs. It, It gives the connotation that an idol of the heart is formed when you attempt to follow two different shepherds. An idol of the heart is formed when you attempt to go two different directions and to follow two different shepherds, to live with one foot planted firmly in the church and the other foot planted firmly in the world, trying to live two different lives, trying to live in two different worlds. Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You got to love one and you got to hate the other. You can't live in two different worlds. You can't just ride the fence live one way on Sunday and another way on Monday no you got to make up your mind choose you this day who you are going to serve is there anybody on this first night of Atlantic Youth Retreat that would say I'm making my decision tonight I'm gonna let it be known I am gonna serve God I wish I had a few more people that would make up their mind tonight that there's nothing in the world that has your interest, that there's nothing worth missing heaven over. Who is going to decide I'm serving God? The idols and images referenced in Scripture represent many gods. There's Ashtaroth and Baal and Dagon and Gad and Molech and Nebo and so many others that are referenced. But I want to speak tonight about an idol not specifically named in Scripture, but one that I believe represents this spirit of our age. It's an idol called image. 
It's an idol that seeks to align itself between the church and the church that God intends us to be. That seeks to align itself between us and the individual, the potential that God wants us to be. This idol seeks to erode the foundation of truth upon which we stand. To destroy the distinct identity that defines the apostolic church. An identity that sets us apart from our culture this idol called image seeks to eliminate absolutes it desires conformity and loathes confrontation it's a blending of ideas and humanistic philosophies religious creeds and belief systems that blurs the lines of distinction creating a pluralistic religious system where there are no expectations no standards no call for change or life transformation why change when everybody's right We live in such a strange culture where everybody is accepted except for those who might say that there's certain distinctives or absolute truths. Everybody else is accepted as long as you say that everybody else is okay. But the moment that you go to say that there might be truth, that there might be an absolute truth, that there might be only one God and his name is Jesus, there's a spirit of this age that begins to rise up that begins to fight against that truth. This idol seeks to be politically correct rather than biblically sound. It desires affirmation and acceptance and fears rejection. It seeks inclusion and unity at all costs and shuns separation and sanctification. I'm all for unity. Unity is important but it's also important to what you're unifying around it's also important to what you are unified about we need unity but not at the expense of truth we need unity but not at the expense of holiness we need unity but not at the expense of our identity This idol called image is more concerned with what others think than with what God commands. It is more concerned with the approval of man than the approval of God. God is less concerned with you being happy and more concerned with you being holy. In this culture that caters to everybody's feelings doing everything to just feel good guess what it's not all about just feeling good a cross doesn't doesn't feel good but God's not interested in you just being happy but he wants to shape you and form you and make you into a holy vessel is there anybody tonight that hungers to be holy is there anybody that's passionate tonight about being in his presence and for him to shape us and and form us in his image. It's the only attribute of God that he ever called us to emulate. He didn't say be omnipresent as I am omnipresent. He didn't say be omniscient as I am omniscient. He didn't say be omnipotent as I am omnipotent. But he did say, be holy as I am holy. He said, there's got to be a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And if you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. And I believe you will be fulfilled. You will be disappointed. You will be unfulfilled. You will, you will face desper- desperation and, and, and you will face all kinds of depression because you seek other things. But when you seek holiness and righteousness, you will be filled and you will be fulfilled. You may not always be happy every day will not always be easy but at the end of the day you'll know I fulfilled the will of God and there's nothing more rewarding or more fulfilling than doing the will of God this idol called image God spoke through his prophet Isaiah and gave them instruction about the dangers the spirit of this age in Isaiah chapter 8 Beginning in verse number 11, this is the amplified version. 
The Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people. In other words, he simply said, don't think like everybody else thinks around you. That's good instruction. Don't think like everybody else. Don't, don't think like everybody you go to school with. Just because the majority believes something doesn't make it right. God is a majority all by himself. It doesn't matter if everybody else votes against it. Whatever God says is truth. Don't think like everybody else thinks. Anybody's mama ever told you, you're going to go jump off the cliff just because everybody else is jumping off the cliff? Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it right. Just because you're not convicted about it doesn't make it right. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Don't think like everybody else around you. Verse number 12, don't call conspiracy or holy all that this people call conspiracy or holy. Don't fear what they fear. Just because somebody calls it holy doesn't mean it's holy. Just because somebody calls it Christian doesn't make it Christian. We need a spirit of discernment to help us today. We got to be full of the Holy Ghost. When you walk out of the door of your bedroom and your home, you need to make sure that you've already prayed through in the Holy Ghost because you're walking into a culture, the spirit of this age that is against everything that you stand for. You got to have a spirit of discernment to understand those that you're around, the atmosphere that you are in. There's simply some places you should not be. There's some people you should not be around. There's some things you don't need to listen to. There's some things you don't need to watch. Why? Because they're connected to a spirit. It's a pervasive spirit. It's a militant spirit that wants nothing less than to kill and destroy and to steal. That's what the enemy of your soul is trying to do. Don't call it holy just because somebody else calls it holy. It goes on to say in verse number 13, fear God. Don't fear man. Reverence and respect God rather than man. Because the opinion that you respect the most ultimately will be the opinion that you submit to. And your life and your lifestyle testify tonight who you're trying to please. I cannot hear what you're saying because your words are being drowned out by your actions. Our actions are a physical representation of our value system. It does not matter what we say that we believe. It does not matter what we proclaim, whether from a pulpit or a pew or wherever it may be. It does not matter what the sign on the outside of our church says that we are. It does not matter if we put it across our shirt. I'm an apostolic Pentecostal. Our actions declare they are a physical representation of our value system. What you value will be displayed through your actions. What you value will be revealed through how you live your life. Your lifestyle reveals who you're trying to please. The image that you you portray it testifies who you're seeking affirmation and acceptance from and people will do absolutely crazy irrational things just to get a little bit of attention affirmation and acceptance technology the internet social media has made this all the more evident we get to see everybody's craziness. It's on display. I mean, just go to YouTube for 30 seconds. It's, it's amazing what people will do to try to gain a few views, a few likes, a few shares and reposts. People will do absolutely crazy things driven by this insatiable desire for approval. So motivated by this need for affirmation that they will just go right, blow right by good old common sense. You don't even have to have the Holy Ghost to know some things are just stupid. <laughs> just blow right by it to try to gain that affirmation and that acceptance. And so God said, don't allow the spirit of this age and the mindset of your culture to influence them how you think, to shape your mind because right thoughts precede right 
actions. And that's why it's so critical in this age of information and technology that you carefully control the media that's speaking into your life. And there are so many access points to your soul, every kind of media available, print media, video media, social media, music media. And what is the message of this media? Image. Our culture is consumed with image. It's all about how you look. It's how you're perceived. You've got your online persona, a social media image that you have to protect. Now, Pastor Lehman, when I was a teenager, I, I wondered if I was in the cool crowd. I wondered if, if you know, my outfit was cool. If, if, you know, is this the cool table at school? I, I wondered kind of where I fit in into my social standing and the social structure. But you guys today, you don't have to wonder. Your social stance and, and condition has been set for you. It's been determined for you. It's got a number assigned to it. How many friends? How many followers? How many likes? I mean, you, you, you buy the same pair of shoes, post the same cool picture that your friend did. They get 100 likes, you get three likes. What is up with that? It's the same shoes. I mean, what's going on? Your social standing has been assigned a number. And your emotions, your life purpose, the direction for your life, your checkbook is influenced by the message of media, the message of image. I have to appear a certain way to please a certain person or to fit in with a certain group. And you listen to certain voices long enough and allow certain influences long enough and you'll soon be thinking like the source of those voices. you got to consider what is your inspiration every morning when you wake up? What moves you? What inspires you? What drives you to do what you do? Whose opinion influences your decisions? Who are you trying to please with the way that you dress and the way that you act and the way that you live and the places that you go? Who are you trying to please? There's a danger in this sensually saturated environment that we're a part of, of being conditioned and not even knowing it. There's a process of conditioning that can occur. If you don't destroy that idol of image every day, what you used to hate, you start to tolerate through the conditioning of your environment. And, and you tolerate something long enough, you'll soon start to gain interest in that. And once interested, you'll soon be entertained by it. And before long, what you used to hate, you will start to participate in. And once you start to self-justify your involvement in something that you used to hate, you are so bound by deception and by the spirit of this age it's gonna take a holy ghost awakening to arrest your attention and to break you free from that bondage of deception i'm trying to shake somebody tonight i'm trying to get somebody's attention to recognize we're in a battle and your soul is at stake don't allow your environment to desensitize you don't allow this environment of sensuality and carnality and secularism to begin to shape and influence your thinking. Daniel chapter 3, we find three young men who understood both the challenge and also the opportunity of their day. They were the best and the brightest of the Hebrews and of the Babylonians. The Bible says of these three young men that there was no blemish in them. They were good looking. They were gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand. They had ability to serve in the king's palace. Early on in their captivity, you know the story, they refused to be defiled by the king's meat by the king's wine. God blessed them with knowledge and skill and understanding. There was none like them in all of the kingdom. The Bible says that they were 10 times better than the magicians and astrologers of Babylon. I tell you all that because I want you to understand and think about what happens in Daniel chapter three in this context. The three Hebrew boys were very well known by the king. 
In fact, those who reported their refusal to bow down said, these three guys that you appointed, King Nebuchadnezzar, these are the three guys that you chose. You handpicked them to serve in the kingdom. They're the ones who are refusing to bow down. The king knew them well. He knew there was something special about them. They were healthier and smarter than everybody else. And they knew things that nobody else knew. They could do things that nobody else could do. So they received this special personal invitation to come to the dedication of the idol. Think about the position that they now find themselves in. They've been treated very well by the king. They found favor with the king and enjoyed his approval and acceptance. They've been promoted to special positions within the kingdom. And up to this point, they've been able to enjoy the good life and still not violate their convictions. They've been able to engage their culture and yet not compromise their beliefs. Yes, they had a close call with the king's meat and wine, but they worked out that little arrangement and made their way around that challenge. But you know, at that point... They really didn't have a whole lot to lose. But now things are different. They've enjoyed some success. They've been promoted and affirmed. And the favor of the king and his acceptance, his approval is on the line. Now they have something to lose. Their current positions, their influence, their wealth is on the line. Their future success in the kingdom, their potential future earning power is at stake. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not shrink from this challenge. Think about the gathering that was there that day. Those that were invited represented the best and the brightest. They were the influencers, the movers and the shakers, the leaders of every religion, the magicians and astrologers, the politicians and the business owners. It represented the very elite of their day, every philosophy and religion and denomination, every political party and every social movement. They were all there. And at the end of the day, everybody bowed down. Everybody. Every religion. Every social group, everybody came together. They all bowed down. And I am quite sure that those three Hebrew boys were not the only Hebrews that were in the crowd that day. There were probably some other Hebrews that thought, you know what? It's just going to be more convenient. It's going to be better if I just bow down. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to worship. I'm just going to bend my knee. I'm just going to bow down for a moment. Maybe nobody will see it or recognize it. There were those in the crowd that day that were Hebrews who understood Understood that they were not to bow, but only three Hebrew boys made that decision when everybody else gave in to the command. Everybody else said, yes, I'll give in to fit in. I'll bow before the idol called image. I'm not going to fight the pressure or the system. I'm not going to challenge the status quo. And one by one, they started to drop to their knees. They surrendered their distinctives. They bowed to the pressure of the king's social agenda. Let's come together for the sake of unity, for the sake of fitting in, for the sake of acceptance and affirmation in that kingdom. They sold out their belief system in deference to the king of that that world everybody bowed down except for three Hebrew boys they were in a strange land an immoral society immersed in a culture with a plurality of deities but they did not forget who they were they did not lose their identity and they were not ashamed of their heritage they came to the party but they refused to bow their knee. They were obedient to the king's command up to a point, but they drew a line in the sand and said, we're not crossing that line. They were engaged in their culture as long as it did not change them and their belief system. Something had been instilled in them from the time that they were three little Hebrew boys. I'm sure as the king gave that command for everybody to bow down, as the music began to play, those three Hebrew boys heard the voices of mama and daddy ringing in their ears. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Something had been instilled in them from the time they were just young Hebrew boys. You're not to bow down before a graven image. You're not to serve any other gods. There's only one God. 
What was it that enabled them to stand when everybody else bowed? What was it that gave them that ability to put it all on the line, the positions, the success, the favor, the acceptance? I believe it was the simple fact that they feared God more than they feared the king. They refused to bow before that idol called image because they had already surrendered unconditionally to the God called Jehovah. Two years ago at North American Youth Congress, I, I introduced the crowd to the crowd that night, a young lady by the name of Roseanne Othman. Roseanne lives in Indiana. She was raised in the Muslim faith when she was about 12 years old. She visited a United Pentecostal church with a friend. She was baptized in Jesus' name, and she received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But when she went back home, she did not step into an environment that was supportive of the decisions that she had made that day. She went back into that home and that Muslim faith. And her mother and her brothers, they began to beat her. She was physically abused. She was sexually abused. She was verbally abused. Her mom told her, every day when you walk out of the door of this house, I pray that something bad would happen to you. I pray that something will happen so bad that it will cause you to stop going to that Pentecostal church. That will cause you to stop serving that God named Jesus. She endured all of that abuse. They even sent her back over into the Middle East to try to get her away from that church. But they had to send her back because she was testifying to her friends. And she was witnessing to her relatives. And they were afraid that she was going to convert some of them. And they sent her back to Indiana. And when she came back, she went back to her church in spite of the opposition. In spite of the persecution, she just kept serving God. She's a, a, a musician at her church. She's a Sunday school teacher. She's a youth leader today. And I have good news. That mom who prayed against her now prays with her, full of the Holy Ghost. I've come to challenge somebody tonight who is going to stand in the face of opposition, in the face of persecution. Who's going to stand up and say, I am going to serve the only true God. I want you to stand with me tonight. You got to make up your mind. No matter the pressure to conform, no matter the pressure to compromise, no matter the pressure to give in, there's nothing and there's nobody in this world worth bowing down to. Whose affirmation and acceptance? Are you seeking tonight? Who is it that you desire to please? If you're seeking the affirmation of others, seeking the affirmation of your peers, you're never going to be good enough. There, there's always going to be somebody stronger, somebody better, somebody prettier, somebody more talented, somebody more popular. You're never going to be able to please everybody you're never going to be able to make everybody happy and you're going to be empty you're going to be frustrated you're going to live disappointed always striving for this elusive affirmation that never really comes why do you think hollywood actors with all the attention of the world are addicted to drugs and alcohol and commit suicide. Because that affirmation of your peers, of culture, the spirit of this age, it's always out there just beyond you. Never able to attain, never able to get there, never satisfied. But there is one tonight who loves you, who affirms you, who cares about you because he created you and he made you in his image and he put value in you because he made you in his image and there's nothing that you can do to change that there's nothing so bad that you could ever do that would cause him to love you less there's nothing so good that you could do that would cause him to love you more there's a God that cares about you. 
that affirms you, that has purpose for you. And the challenge of the Spirit tonight is for you to make up your mind. I'm not living to please them. I'm living to please Him. I don't fear them. I fear Him. There's one that I want to please. See, the bottom line is this. Ultimately, you will bow. You will bow. You're going to bow somewhere. You're either going to bow before that idol called image. You're either going to surrender to the spirit of this age. Going to bow at that altar of compromise and cultural acceptance. The affirmation of peers. Or you're going to bow at an altar of surrender and commitment. You're going to bow at an altar of sacrifice. That's your choice tonight. Where are you going to bow? Where are you going to lay your life down? Jesus said, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, you save it. The question is, how are you going to lose yours? How are you going to lose your life? Are you going to lose it to chasing this elusive idol called image? Or are you going to lose it at an altar of surrender and commitment to God? That really, the place where nothing is lost, but everything is gained. Where are you going to bow? I want you to close your eyes all over this sanctuary right now. The Holy Ghost is talking to somebody. I sense some wrestling in the spirit right now. Somebody is waging a little battle in your spirit. You're counting the cost tonight. Some of you are so bound by your fear of what others think that right now you, you are literally paralyzed by the fear of what others would think if you would step out of your pew and begin to walk down here to this altar right now. You are so paralyzed by that fear of what others might think about your decision to commit yourself to God and to surrender to God. But I am declaring tonight that there is going to be supernatural deliverance that's going to take place in the next few moments. God is going to loose you. God is about to set somebody free from the fear of what somebody else thinks from a fear of acceptance of your culture and he is going to loose you into the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost where are you going to bow who are you trying to please tonight Come on, I feel some chains already starting to fall. I, I feel some chains being loosed in this moment right now. In the name of Jesus, I declare deliverance. In the name of Jesus, I declare liberty right now. God has come to set you free from that fear of what others think. Why don't you destroy that idol called image right now? There's some idols of the heart that you need to lay down at this altar that you need to destroy tonight. There's some priorities that need to be rearranged before we leave this service. An idol is anything that you can't say no to. Because that is the position that is reserved for God. I'm speaking to somebody in the Holy Ghost right now. An idol is something that you can't say no to. That is the position that should only be reserved for God in your life. God is the only one that you should never say no to. But if there's something in your life, if it is an addiction, if it's in a relationship, if it's something that has you spiritually bound, that you cannot say no to. It is an idol in the heart that has taken the place of God. And you gotta lay that idol down. You gotta destroy that idol on this altar tonight. 
Come on, I'm reaching for somebody. There's somebody tonight. It's been a long time since you've had a spiritual breakthrough. You are so conditioned by your environment. You don't even realize right now how deceived you are. You can't even feel God. If that's you right now, if you can't even feel God, if you can't even sense the Holy Ghost, I would run down to this altar. I would fall on this altar tonight and plead with God to set you free from that spirit of delusion, from that spirit of deception. I'm preaching to everybody in this building tonight. There may be an adult who's walked in this place. There may be a backslider who just slipped in tonight. You had no intentions of responding to God. But the Holy Ghost had intentions to get a hold of you. To set you free. To transform you tonight. on the spirits reaching the spirits calling the Holy Ghost is reaching for somebody right now will you just give God a chance will you give God an opportunity would you just open your heart right now lift your voice and begin to cry out to God come on lift those hands and surrender right now all over this sanctuary God here I am God I need you God I give myself to you